I'm Philip Ball, and today on Discovery from the BBC, I'm here with another story from the history of science. Today, the visionary Raman Lull. Imagine you had a theory that allowed you to deduce every true thing about the world. Automatically, as if churned out by a mechanical device. A sort of science of all sciences. A key to the way all knowledge is rationally ordered. What would you do with it? Well, you'd best be careful. Around the end of the 13th century, a European called Ramon Lull believed that he had worked out such a theory. And it didn't do him much good. Because of it, he was lynched, thrown into prison and threatened with execution. That's because, for Lull, the proper use of a theory like this was to do God's work. To prove to everyone, using pure logic alone, that the Christian God was the only true God. Lull can easily sound like a fanatical medieval crackpot, a man who, during the time of the Crusades, had an almost suicidal determination to convert the Islamic world in North Africa to Christianity. By means not of longbow and broadsword, nor even of fire and brimstone preaching, but of mathematical charts and tables. Yet his underlying idea was both extraordinary and influential. He thought that truth could be automated. He developed a scheme that started from a few basic truths or axioms that everyone could agree on. And by combining those in different permutations, he believed he could derive all other true statements. His way of making converts to Christianity would be to present them with a logic they couldn't refute. But today, Raman Lal is hailed not, as you might have hoped, as a prophet of the Christian faith, but of a branch of mathematics and computer science called combinatorics. He was interested in enumerating the combinations of those simple axiomatic truths about religion, what things followed from a small set of divine rules. But for mathematicians, this was just one example among many. Combinatorics has been called the art of arranging objects according to specified rules, or even more simply, the art of counting things. One, two, three, four. Questions of combinatorics crop up in all manner of sciences, in efforts to understand evolution and genes, computers and atoms, graphs and language, even patterns in musical rhythm. In these fields and others, we might find ourselves asking a deceptively simple question. How many things are there, and how can we arrange them? Raman Lal's attempt to turn his faith into a system of logic didn't, in the end, win over many converts. But today we can see that it was the beginning of a very deep inquiry into the way the world fits together. Even by medieval standards, Lull was something of a jack of all trades. He was knowledgeable in the sciences of his day, in arithmetic and geometry, astronomy and medicine. He wrote chivalric poetry in the troubadour tradition of southern Europe. One of the most surprising things about Lull from today's perspective is that while he wrote many of his major works in Latin, he also wrote a great deal in his native tongue, which was Catalan. Writing in any vernacular language was a rare thing for the late 13th century, but Catalan? Yet that's not actually such an odd choice, and it gives an important insight into Lull's world. He was born in Palma on Mallorca, probably in 1232. At that time, Mallorca was at the centre of the thriving commercial network of the Mediterranean and was one of the most cosmopolitan places in Europe. 
It lay within Catalonia in eastern Spain, a kingdom in its own right. Its culture and language were more closely allied to the Provençal culture of France than to the rest of Spain, and Catalan served as a kind of lingua franca for this region of the Mediterranean. The big issue of the time in this part of the world was the interaction between the Christian lands and the Islamic culture of North Africa. The Spaniards were slowly reclaiming the peninsula from what were then called the Moors or Saracens, generally by force. But at the same time, there was a busy trade between these two worlds, not just of goods, but of ideas. By his own admission, Lull was anything but devout in his younger days. He said he was licentious and worldly. Born to a wealthy and possibly noble family, he spent his days wooing women with love songs and poems. But one day, he said, he was doing just that when he had a vision of Christ on the cross. This revelation returned again and again, and at first he was terrified. Then he figured that God was calling him into service, and he made it his mission to convert the Saracens to Christianity. Today, that whole impulse of medieval Christendom to convert the heathen by the sword if necessary leaves a very bad taste. But it is surely to Lull's credit that he decided instead to do his missionary work by opening up a dialogue, which meant that he learned Arabic and read the Quran so that he would be able to debate and communicate properly. Lull figured that to make his case compelling, he needed to show how the Christian faith and its mysteries, such as the doctrine of the Trinity, formed the basic set of truths from which all else that we see and experience, all human knowledge, can be explained. You could call it a medieval theory of everything. Sometime around the 1270s, he began to put together his grand scheme, which he simply called the Great Art, and which became known as the Lullian Art. It's not an easy thing to describe, partly because it seems today a slightly bizarre idea. What he was really doing was rather like the way the ancient Greek mathematicians proved theorems from a set of basic axioms using logic and calculation, an approach that mathematicians still use today. It's just that Lull's axioms weren't things like two parallel lines will never cross, but God is one and God is eternal. These, he reasoned, were principles on which Christians, Muslims and Jews would all agree. A common ground for all the Judeo-Christian faiths in the Mediterranean region. The Lullian art consisted of using diagrams and mechanical manipulations, including rotating concentric wheels, to combine these axioms into more complex statements about the world. Not just the spiritual world, but the material one that was studied by natural philosophers. He represented the axioms in a way no one had done before, a symbolic notation in which each was assigned a letter, comprising a kind of alphabet of human thought. In this way, Lull hoped to show that the Christian mysteries were demonstrated in the patterns of the universe all around us. His art was a sort of science of all sciences, a key to the way all knowledge was rationally ordered. And whatever faith you followed, Lull believed, you'd no more be able to refute these logical truths than you could refute a proof in geometry. It was a non-confrontational approach, not a case of my holy book against yours, but of cool, clear reason. To delve deeper into this complex Lullian art, I spoke to historian Pamela Beatty of the University of Louisville in Kentucky. Raymond Lull, in his early works, was decidedly not in favor of crusade. He felt that armed confrontation was against the plan of God. It was against the peaceful ideas of the gospel. It was not in accordance with the ideals of the imitation of Christ. And he would prefer to convert people to Christianity through methods of dialogue and develop this system that demonstrated 
Christian doctrine logically. Lowell would have been exposed to key thinkers, Arabic thinkers, philosophers, scientists, and also introduced to important Jewish intellectual traditions also. In the 12th and 13th century, there were other people who were really starting to be interested in the relationship between reason and faith. But the degree and the way in which Lal did this was highly unusual. Well, it's certainly his method, his art, certainly looks peculiar today and incredibly complicated from what I've seen of it. It's it's right. pretty hard to figure out how it was supposed to work. How well can we reconstruct the way he thought it was going to work? Well, in the end of the 13th century, the main way of reasoning in the university, so what we would call scholasticism, was based largely on using authority. So accepted texts from history that could be interpreted and put together in new and unique ways. For Christian doctrine, of course, the most authoritative text was the Bible, which consisted of the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, and the New Testament, the Gospels, and the letters of Paul and Revelations. And when most people of Lowell's time period were arguing about uh, matters of faith, they depended on interpretations of those scriptural texts, right, those authoritative texts. Raymond Lull recognized that it was no good trying to have a logical argument with someone if they didn't agree on the basic premises of that argument, right? So he devises this art as a way of bypassing all of that medieval reliance on authorities, and that reliance on authorities existed in the Muslim and Jewish world as well as in the Christian world. And he tried to come up with these generalized principles, philosophical principles, ideas about the nature of the divine, the nature of God, that all groups could agree on, and then work on developing his arguments from there. It sounds then as though it's really quite an original system, quite a break from the way things were done in the past. And if anything, it looks, I mean, even visually, it looks much more allied to geometry and mathematical proofs. Do we know if his scheme actually worked? By which I mean, did he actually convert anyone, either Christians or or Muslims? (laughs) Well, that would be the question, wouldn't it? No, we don't have a whole lot of evidence. I mean, we don't have evidence, honestly, of very many Muslims converting to Christianity in the 13th century anyways. We just don't have a whole lot of evidence. My particular interest in Raymond Lull is how his work reflects those more intellectual, learned, high culture ideas, but tries to communicate them in a way that is accessible to a much wider, more diverse audience. And one of the ways, of course, in which he tried to make that translation was simply by writing at least some of his works, not in Latin but in his vernacular tongue in Catalan. This seems very unusual as well at this time. Right. So we're used to looking at someone like Dante in Italy as someone who first used the Italian language, the Florentine dialect, when he wrote his Divine Comedy in the vernacular. Raymond Lull is first (laughs) because his work in the vernacular Catalan language predates that of Dante by about 25, 50 years And he was one of the first people who used the Catalan language to explore the kinds of philosophical and theological questions that previously had only been explored in Christendom in Latin. And the fact that he did that in Catalan can surprise us today. You might think, well, why (laughs) Catalan near French is one thing. But in fact, uh, it seems as though choosing that language wasn't so unusual given his context and his geographical position at that time. Right. So the Catalan world was a very dynamic commercial world. Majorca, if you look at the map of the Mediterranean, is really strategically located between mainland Spain, North Africa, southern France, and Sicily. So it was a perfect place for people to come together to trade goods, but also to trade ideas and intensely multicultural kind of region. We don't think of the Middle Ages as being so diverse, but in many places it was, especially in the Mediterranean. And so really wherever you would go in the Mediterranean, you would find enclaves of merchants and 
investors who were adept at the Catalan language. I wouldn't say it was a universal Mediterranean language, although some people have made those kinds of claims, but it was not as strange for him to be writing in that language as one would initially think. And it was his native language, right? So the way that he thought, the way that he initially conceived of his ideas, he began to study Latin, like scholastic Latin, after his conversion. He probably would have had some rudiments of grammar before that. So he never felt really confident in his Latin either. But he was trying to reach an audience beyond the audience of the schools. Communicating in Catalan today is quite a political act. Is he seen as something of an icon or a hero for the campaign for Catalan independence today? Well, yes. There are Raimondas Lolas institutes and faculties and universities and so on named after him is testimony to that. Even though to us he may seem very obscure, the ideas of his art and his attempts at understanding the scientific world have always been important throughout the centuries. Lull died of old age around early 1316, either in Tunis itself or sailing back to Majorca, and he was buried in Parma. After the Black Death of the 14th century, and then the Renaissance, the intellectual achievements of the Middle Ages tend to get eclipsed. But Lull's art is in fact recognised by computer scientists today as a kind of language in which the basic elements are combined according to rules to make complex statements. And in using a symbolic code to represent those elements, his system resembles nothing so much as a modern computer language, where simple instructions and operations are combined to conduct some complicated calculation. Computer coding is just one aspect of this art of combinations, that is, this branch of mathematics called combinatorics. You could put the basic idea this way. You have a set of objects and a set of rules for how to combine them. How many different arrangements can you make? Which ones are allowed and which are not? Which arrangements are best? Make those objects atoms and the art of combinatorics becomes about what sorts of molecules and substances are possible in the world. But equally, you might need combinatoric logic to figure out how to arrange guests at a wedding meal. Many games are exercises in combinatorics, from chess and go to sudoku and tic-tac-toe. This is a branch of maths so broad that no one really knows where it starts and stops. For a bit of help with that, I turned to Marcus de Sotoy, mathematician and Simonyi professor for the public understanding of science at Oxford University. In fact, it applies to so many different fields. Particle physics, for example, the number of atoms that we can have is looking at the different combinations of fundamental particles that can be built up to make an atom. So we know about the periodic table through a sort of question of combinatorics there. The field of probability, for example, trying to assess the probability of a particular thing happening really depends on working out all the different possibilities of combinations and then testing those within a restricted range. So, for example, if you're trying to decide what the probability of winning the lottery is or of getting three numbers out of the six that come up. Somebody's going to need to assess that in order to then decide, well, what are the winnings that should be given to somebody who gets three out of the six numbers right? So I think that combinatorics is a very important place in considerations of probability. And I'm wondering about areas like language. It sounds as though you know that you come not just with a set of objects that you can permute, but with rules that determine what the allowed permutations are. And in language, those rules are presumably grammatical rules and syntactic rules. So is it useful for trying to understand what is grammatically allowed in language, for example? Language is one of the first places that combinatorics was used in. People were interested in what sort of different words you could make out of fundamental 
total sounds. And at first sight, you might say, well, it's just, you know, you could look at all the different combinations of sounds, but some of them don't work against each other. So you don't want too many vowels one after another. You might want to stick a consonant sort of sound in there. And so you'll start to get restrictions on the way that these things can combine. And that starts to make the combinatorics uh, much more interesting. And that then gives you a possibility, well, how many different words can you have in a language given particular sounds? And how do you work out what the allowed combinations are? Is it just a matter of plodding through, you know, literally all the different permutations that are allowed by the rules? Or are there shortcuts you can take? You could, of course, just list all the possibilities. But mathematicians are very lazy at heart. So what we like to do is to find some trick which helps us to calculate very quickly the number of possibilities. So actually, there was a very interesting case of combinatorics uh, with the Lego company because they said, you know, what if I've got a certain number, say six of the um, bricks with sort of four by two bricks, how many different ways can I combine those to make different buildings? And it turns out to be a phenomenally large number. And combinatorics can help you to see what the world of possibilities is. What often happens is that there turn out to be many more combinations than people expect. What do you think is Ramon Lull's position in the history of these ideas? It's interesting that combinatorics starts very early in the idea of thought and mathematics. But I think one of the things that Lull was doing was creating almost a, an algebraic language to be able to navigate these possibilities. So rather than getting sort of fixated on actually what the things are, whether they're words or number of Lego bricks or something that you're putting together, he realised that um, there's a kind of mathematical analysis. You, you can abstract the whole thing and just count the possible letter combinations. And then those letters can stand for different things, you know, uh, properties of the soul or uh, perhaps different ways of putting toppings on a, a pancake but the mathematics will be universal to all of those. I guess one of the things that strikes me also is that, of course, it was never Lowell's ambition to launch a new field of mathematics. He was interested in, in a sense, a very practical problem of how best to convert unbelievers to Christianity. It was quite an original idea, but you see this beginning to emerge during this period, the idea that logical argument should be powerful enough to tease out fundamental things about the universe, not just scientifically, but theologically as well. So, you know, in the past, mathematics of the ancient Greeks was about lines, planes, points, and how they interact with each other. But here we see philosophers beginning to think, well, if this is about the power of logical argument to show how things are connected, you take smaller things, put them together, and you can get a larger insight on the universe. Why shouldn't that apply not just to points, lines and planes, but maybe even to properties of the soul? I wonder whether this is a common feature of how mathematics evolves, that people don't sit down and think, I wonder how many different combinations of things I can make. But they're looking at a very practical problem and realise that actually it's a mathematical problem that they have to work through. Is that the case in the history of maths more generally? I think that all of mathematics basically starts with a very specific problem, which as you begin to analyse it, you realise the actual things that you're dealing with are, are less important. It's the kind of structural relationship between those things. And and that's what Lul is, is realising, that the sort of diagrams he starts producing really can apply to many different things. He starts with the idea of properties of the soul, how many different ways can you put those together? And he wants to consider all different possibilities, all the bases covered so that nobody can have a counter argument because he's already dealt with that particular combination. But then you start to see appearing a language which says, well, that can apply to almost any combination of uh, three things chosen from six. It doesn't have to be three properties of a soul uh, chosen from any possibilities it it then can apply to to many different fields and that's that's the beginning of kind of a mathematical way of thinking realizing the actual thing itself is not so important it's the structural relationship between those things i'm wondering too what the role of computers is in this field because you know we we find it almost looks as though lol is trying to create a simple kind of computer with you know rotating bits of paper you could imagine that today To solve a problem, a combinatorial problem like this, you can just get a computer to do it. So, you know, is there still a role for mathematical thinking for people to do this enumeration in some ways? Or can you just delegate it to a computer now? Well, I think that's one of the interesting things is this kind of combination between thought and machine. 
Because those little diagrams that he draws with concentric circles spinning and you're trying to work out the different possibilities of combining things with the two spinning wheels it is the forerunner of the idea of uh, a machine where the cogs somehow help you to do the calculations. And I think what we're seeing today in modern combinatorics is still this combination of the necessity of deep thought, but also the power of a machine to implement that deep thought and get big answers. Very often, the combinatorics runs away such that you need to find still an efficient way. The computer can't cover all the different possibilities mechanically. So I think you're still seeing this nice combination of deep mathematical thought, but combined with machine. A laptop computer might seem a surprising embodiment of an idea devised in the 13th century to prove that Christianity is the one true religion. But I'm not sure that Raman Lull, with his charts and rotating diagrams, would have been totally surprised to see the method behind his great art find such wider applications. After all, what he was advocating was the power of logic in understanding how the world works. And the marvelous it didn't have to be a matter of my belief, my dogma over yours. You can start with the common ground, with things you can all agree to be true, and by combining them, find out what follows. The debate can be based in reason and grounded in truth. That feels like a pretty sound message for our times. <laughs> 